What's going on, everybody? It's Frito here for your Overwatch. So excited the Overwatch League is finally coming back. I've been missing high-level Overwatch. And this year, they're instituting a format that is stuff that I've been asking for for a long time. So I think it's about to be a really cool year. Important to explain what that is because I think it's going to dramatically change how the teams are going to perform over this season. The way it's going to work is that there is far fewer regular season games. You play a few before a tournament just to seed the tournament. Another big change is that on each tournament, international play will finally be featured throughout the season, not just at the end of playoffs. They'll first be like a mini knockout stage to eliminate who's not going to go on to the international section of the tournament, though a lot of the teams are probably never going to make it, having been knocked out in their region beforehand. The cool thing about this is wasted matches are gone. The lower ranked teams won't play nearly as much. Because of this format, teams that are stronger in the style of gameplay tournaments promote will succeed, which is to say you have to plan for the short term rather than try to develop your team for the long haul over the season. You really have to do what you can to develop your own strats now because the wins you have now are worth more in each tournament than let's say like trying to master the meta for the long haul so that you're good at the end of the season. Well, they're mixing up the meta with hero pools for the first couple tournaments and with regular balance patching. They're trying to stop you from being able to do that essentially. So the teams that can think on their feet a little faster or have just a more talented roster, I think, bias a little bit in this format. If you saw last year's grand final, a team like Soul Dynasty, which had a middling season the whole year, was able to come up in the clutch when some of their heroes were good, and that's just sort of how they naturally play. They have a chance of showing up in an explosive fashion to seemingly punch above their weight. Now, another wrinkle on this that I can't really account for, but is an important one, is that there's a huge online component to all this. The international play is going to be using a new networking feature that is called minimum latency, which essentially means they're going to be playing with a minimum amount of ping for both teams in order to try to equalize it. It's hard to say now, but there's a chance that that drastically changes what heroes are even ever playable on that format. Like, can you even play a Doomfist on 100 ping or whatever it's going to be? Granted, it's fair on both sides, but they're playing a very different game than if they were to play at LAN. Just considerations for you. Important to highlight because each year it feels feels like there are these big changes that hinge how the power of teams play out. I've had really up and down experiences with these tier list videos because year one, the most important things were star power, especially on carry heroes like Zenyatta, Tracer, and Widowmaker. So when I went into year two, I was like, let's rank based on that, which turned out to be the worst possible decision as we had a year of GOATS meta, the most MOBA and teamwork gameplay Overwatch has ever seen for an entire year. Year three, I tried to be a bit more intelligent with this and broaden that to not be overly all in on one strategy. When I had a rough look back at my tier list video from last year, it pretty much panned out really well to how things played out. Plus or minus, you know, some surprises and developments. But I think that's where you should try to pay attention to mine or anybody's power rankings is what are the arguments they're using to come to those conclusions? Okay, now getting right into it. Starting with the D tier. These are teams that I think you can kind of interchange based on the balance state going up or down based on their hot or cold streaks. But the reliable attribute for me in the D tier is that we won't be seeing much of these teams. They'll have their regular season matches and they'll either struggle to even get into the tournaments or reliably kind of be fodder for the rest of the league. Kick it off with the last place team on my list. Bit of a hot take. I put Paris all the way at the bottom, mainly because I find that this roster might be good enough in contenders, but in the Overwatch League, you really need some X factor players because so many other teams have them. Even lower ranked teams have them. Now granted, even being the worst team in Overwatch League means you're stacked with amazing talented players, but in context to the other maniacs in the league, it's pretty tough. And I just look at this roster and I'm struggling to find how they're going to set up win conditions. And what I mean is, when you jockey for position to try to find who's going to be your playmaker, I just don't see it, especially for the types of metas Overwatch I expect is going to have in the future. I'm glad to be proven wrong, but I'm putting a EU contenders level team at the bottom and the next up shouldn't surprise anybody. Now a China contenders level team at the next spot with the LA Valiant, who you may not even know, but dropped their entire roster, moved to China, picked up a budget Chinese roster, and all those 
those things might be pointing they should be at the last place of the list, but I rate Crystal as that type of playmaking player, which is why they are up one rank for me. I think they might have a chance to steal a couple wins away from teams who underestimate them just based on that talent alone. Also, reports are they're doing well in scrims. And there's something to be said about Chinese Overwatch that just in general, it has a puncher's chance style to it. So I'm not going to say they're exactly going to be like the Chengdu Hunters. I'm just saying you can expect some Chinese style Overwatch from this team, I think, which might just take a team off guard with their offbeat style. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> and in my rankings, I do find it useful to try to rank teams in totality, but these bottom level teams likely will never play each other if they get knocked out in their regional tournaments before the international stages come through. So we may never really know where these stack up, but for me, I'm putting Vancouver next up on the list because I have a little bit more faith in their core to consistently make some plays in a meta. Despite getting beaten thoroughly last year, Shredlock on tank was very promising for me. Dalton had some nutty plays and on the right patch, Maybe Linkser gets comfortable again. Not too enthused by this backline of Fire and Rolf. And another thing that's probably a blind spot for me at this bottom end of the tier list is I don't have too much faith in coaches transforming really low level teams. It might change up this tier of the power ranking, but I don't see any team in this section to be tier jumping even with elite level coaches. So to that degree, maybe I should have gave Paris more benefit of the doubt because Vancouver doesn't look strong in that aspect. But at this point, I feel like I'm splitting hairs and just should move on. London is next up on the list. And I think you could make an argument, could slip into one of the other Western teams below them. I have very similar sentiments about this team. They're another Western-centric team, which I think would make you a good contenders roster. And luckily, they do have some Overwatch League experience, but some of it is mediocre experience, in my opinion. Kellex has had some seasons where he really struggled, and I think he's about to have another one because his team's not much better than the previous teams he's been on. Though I will say Shax is a deep DPS you can count on to be really trying to keep this team in the game and perhaps reliably beat the teams below them. Next up at 16th, I have the Toronto Defiant, which I think can finally put to rest the analysts that were really high on Sato last year. The reason why I single him out is because my opinion on Sato did not change, although he had better results last year. I don't think his performances were as improved as a lot of people are making it seem. I think he was just on a far more superior team. I'll talk more about this when we get to the fusion, but last year, Sato had what I thought was elite, maybe even the best May player early in the season in Ivy, and then Hisu, who I believe was the best Sombra, and then throughout the season, who I thought were the best supports in the game, with Funny Astro on the Lucio and Alarm on Flex support. And the problem I have is that I don't feel anyone really gives credit to the teamwork that's required to produce effect out of your main tank position. A main tank can throw the game, but he also can just carve up easy wins when his team is winning it for him already. With the elite play of his Lucio or May player, so many team fights last year, Sato could have been any player in the league and still won easily. But when you got into the tournaments, when he went up against a counterpart, an elite level tank like Smurf on the San Francisco Shock, he made crucial mistakes that proved to me anyway he's not ready for prime time. Not to mention in the grand finals, his Roadhog was just non-existent. They couldn't even play the comp. So keep in mind, he and Phil Philly's former coach, KDG, from last year, along with Hisu, the DPS who was kind of stealing some playtime from Carpe. I actually like Hisu quite a bit, surprisingly for his Reaper, which is not a hero that anyone ever really talks about. But between that and his Sombra, you're going to get a lot of good production out of Hisu in that sort of game sense DPS position. Otherwise, most of this roster I would categorize as bog standard for the league, and that's not good enough to escape this tier for me. Next up at 15th is Boston, which again, you can go plus or minus like three for any of these recent ones, and I wouldn't be too upset. Boston's very similar, where they do pick up a more flexible main tank. Fusions is strong on the Reinhardt, but Stand 1 might finally get some playtime where he's not just getting subbed out for Fearless like he was last year. Sort of the tragedy of Stand 1 is that he just wasn't as good as Fearless, so really he was kind of wasted on that roster. Here, I think he will see some more play, but I'm not too impressed. Like many teams this year, they might have some shining light in the rookie that they picked up. For them, Valentine on DPS might be the catalyst to break this team to the next tier. Their strongest player for me overall is Punk. 
Monk, who, if he gets to play a mechanical off-tank character like Sigma, between that and Myungbun, who's actually nutty on flex support, you can convert some team fights with those picks in the right meta. So as we keep going along, I think they can reliably beat the teams below them. Next up is the Guangzhou Charge, who actually feel really similar in style to the Boston Uprising, where they've got a couple DPS that I know will surprise you. Krong as well on off tank is a comparable fragger to Punk. But in the same way, I've got question marks on the main tank. Rio was always good, and perhaps it's the coaching or prep of this team that makes their teamwork look only average, not great for me. Maybe Jihoon comes in as a rookie and changes that, but... The thing for me with this team is that they play in the more hectic Asian region. Their record was good last year, but I just was never really impressed. At no point did I feel they were a threat to go deep in an international tournament, which is what we're going to have every stage now. So although they might do fine regionally, I don't think they have the punching power to go much above. And that goes for the next up team. Okay, the D tier is a big mess for me. Way too many teams in it, but it's confusing. Makes more sense when you think about the tournament structures we'll be playing in. So this year's tier ranking, I'm trying to get it more pyramid shaped in order to reflect how a tournament shakes up. And this next tier in C tier are teams that I expect to get knocked out at some point. Maybe a D ranked team steals their place or they lose in the bracket somewhere. I don't expect them to just take a tournament. Remember, in order to do so, you have to survive past the teams in your region, then go play internationally against the best teams of the other region every time. So it's really hard to do, and the better teams are going to do it over and over again, really pushing out most of the league, which is why the ratings might look a little lopsided. So starting off is our first gatekeeper type team at rank number 13, the Atlanta Reign last year had really high hopes due to their DPS power from Edison, who never really seemed to blossom on the battlefield. Looks like they're doing that again, picking up a nut rookie in Pelican, who's getting a lot of hype, but I just can't help but think this tank and support core isn't cut out for the next tier, which breaks my heart because I want to rep USA. I'm a fan of Gator and Hawk. I like Masa's playstyle, but I think as time has gone on, the league has evolved beyond Masa's capabilities, and he's never really looked better than he did in the GOATS era. Gator invented GOATS and is really skilled, but the sum of the parts when you put these together doesn't feel like a imposing team, though they are a reliable one, which maybe can get to like 10th or so and still be that gatekeeper team that is a challenge for somebody on the bracket road. Next up at the 12 spot is going to be the NYXL. We're nearing the middle of the entire list. And that's kind of how I feel where you should put your expectations on Nixel. I will say they are getting early scrim results. Players are saying this DPS core is stacked. From what I've seen, Feather is really good. I'm really high on Ivy. I thought he was crucial to the fusion success last year, but... The reason why I'm not going to go as high as other analysts who are buying the scrim bucks a bit more, maybe they're right, but for me, I anticipate players like Yakpung, Bianca, who are their only two tanks, and Friday, their only main support, to reliably get outplayed in tournaments. This is the type of team that, if we had a regular season, maybe could outskill lower ranked teams that your schedule will have more of. But in a tournament format, to continue, you have to play harder and harder opponents, which means their strategy and execution gets better as you continue. With that being the case, I don't think your team having the strength of just aim is good enough. I think you also need some serious outplay potential from your tank and support players because the higher tier teams have that and good DPS. Keep in mind as well, Yakpung had a pretty rough go of the Overwatch League, went down to contenders, came back to play main tank. He's mechanically fine, but he reminds me of Sato in a lot of ways, where I just feel like there's sections of his career where I'm just questioning what he's doing. And it has to be he's out of sync with his team. They're not on the same page. Sometimes that's not the tank's fault, but We'll have to monitor this closely because that also was a recurring problem when Mano had a pretty poor season last year or whenever NYXL struggled in the past of the previous iterations of the roster, which, yeah, I forgot to mention, they dropped everybody except for Jonak. This is a rebuilding year, and it would be a shock if this team was all of a sudden top five, like some people seem to see. I, I just I don't know how you make a brand new team and do that. I don't know if it's ever been done, but I can buy that they're middle table and will outskill teams below 
below them. Next up at number 11 is the Houston Outlaws, who are reportedly pounding in scrims, which again is a metric I'm pretty loose on, especially when both of your tanks are rookies to the Overwatch League. Now, a huge asterisk has to come over all of this because this team has Junk Buck at the helm, who was of the coaching staff of Krusty, this little old team you may have heard of, the San Francisco Shock. So this is the beginning of us seeing if that experience of being around a high-level coach, splitting off to go coach your own team, does create that ripple effect in command over the game. I'm generally pretty biased on coaching, and I want to believe that narrative, that they deserve to be at least five points higher on my ratings due to the junk buck effect coalescing this roster and holding true to the fact that when you're able to learn under an elite level coach and perhaps even contributed significantly to the Shock's previous two years of success, then you can go take a head coach job to replicate that success on another team. This is the test, but I don't know. I'm just a little worried about the ceiling of their backline where they have no swaps, though it has been said that Jake has been learning support as well. We'll see if maybe that comes into effect. If I was 100% certain that Happy would see playtime and they could build around him and Dante with maybe KSF and Hydration picking up some specialist roles, then I'm starting to see it come together. But my question is, how come we barely saw Happy on the Guangzhou charge? When he's on the server, he's clicking heads like a maniac. What's the story there? So for these reasons, I'm placing Houston at the bottom of their potential, in my opinion. Like, I think they definitely can get this ranking, but I'm erroring on the side of inexperience and that special X factor that I think is going to be required to progress in tournaments far. So for me, they're still a knockout likely team until they prove otherwise and steal the position of someone ranked higher. Next up on the list, smack dab center of the league at number 10 is the Chengdu Hunters, who are attempting seemingly to build a Chinese super team. Well, I say super team, I'm not so sure I think that's the case. A lot of pressure is going to be on Gaga to fulfill the expectations fans have of him, who seems to be Aming 2.0, where he's not just a ball player, perhaps better than Aming, but also plays main tanks, which means this Chengdu roster may be the most strategically flexible version of it we've ever seen. I mean, you would hope so with 12 players. My only problem is I think a lot of these substitutes will feel like lateral moves in power. Sure, you can pull out a lot of different strats and work on a lot of different things, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a stronger team or you can convert it into wins. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why big rosters aren't really utilized in the Overwatch League. I would say somewhere between three up to six of these players see significant bench time rather than significant play time. Incredibly entertaining, Jinmu is a nut and plays with reckless abandon. I love watching his projectile. Leave is a Chinese hitscan legend, but I think just doesn't really stack up to the gods that are in the league. Like the standard is so unbelievably high. So that's how they deserve this ranking. I don't think they'll go far in tournaments, but keep in mind, it's a little bit easier in the Eastern region because the way it goes is each tournament you play a bracket inside your region, knocking out everybody else and then getting down to two teams. And then there's an international tournament with the top four, just like playoffs, basically. Like each tournament is going to feel like the, the sort of grand finals playoff bracket where the top four teams, two from each region, slug it out. Could Chengdu reliably be one of those top two teams? To be honest, I don't rate the East that highly right now so maybe they can do well to get into that top four but i think once they get to that final section i think they'll definitely knock out there another thing to note with chengdu is that i think in the format change they lose the most in the regular season biased format where you have to prep for more games i think chengdu's x factor approach where they come at you with a weird strategy has a bigger potential for success. Whereas when you only play a few games in order to qualify for a tournament and you have so many fewer games that matter more, when teams have the time to prep and focus on Chengdu, I think their style is worse. So while they upgrade parts of their roster, I think contextually the way they play the game is less effective in this new format. Chengdu looked best when they were the thorn in the side of like an established team during the season. Then they picked up wins you were surprised by 
and maybe inflated their value. But in high pressure wins, when the teams that are on a roll are on their way to win the tournament, as opposed to it's just a given week and maybe we end up losing because we're not focusing hard enough to win and beat Chengdu, they're completely different play styles. That hinges on whether I could comfortably put them in the next tier, which for me is the B tier defined by this tier of team could win a tournament, right? If the stars align, they got the right meta, they have the talent and punching power at the top to maybe beat out the rest of the league in a tournament format. At the bottom of B tier is the Hangzhou Spark at nine, who's a team that I struggle to put confidence in. Early scrims say they're struggling, which makes sense because the coaching and management and prep of this team is sometimes a bit questionable, which is to say, I don't think they reliably play at the standard that I expect from the skill level of some of these players. You may not even remember Bernard because he played on London on kind of a sleeper team, but he was insane on that roster, has league experience, and now is aside Gushue, who I think is just a ridiculous talent. IDK is a fragger on the main support and maybe serviceable to strong from the support position and have a good amount of depth at the DPS position. Part of the problem is I think they're stronger at flex DPS than they are hit scan. But my hope is this year, hit scan won't be as make or break for your team. There's been some years where if you just your hit scan was worse, you just lose. But I think with the way the game's been balanced, there's a chance that finally Hangzhou can achieve the tier that they've always kind of looked like they could, but unless it was the right meta for them, they kind of struggled. But I think we'll see that kind of meta this year. And although Architect was not impressive last year, he was picked up by the shock originally for good reason. I think this is going to be a good year for him if he can find the right meta. And it's hard for me to express enough how much better and reliable I think this team's going to play with Bernard on the roster, who while London was losing a lot of games, was playing his position to an incredible degree. And I think that's like the reliable factor this team needs to hold their position here. Next up on the list is Florida, who I'm a bit nervous about, especially when there is good reason to have suspect power of teams I'm putting below them. They have a really lean roster and OGE has let me down from the main tank on many of his other stints in the league. A major downgrade from fate. So the more I say this and look at this, I'm like, why do I have them this high? And I think it's like the core of the team has proven to me that they can learn a meta and really get the most out of their players. Last year, there were threats in tournaments, unleashing Yaki on all the teams that couldn't deal with a tracer until they got to the end. BQB seems pretty underrated and pulls heroes out of his pocket that he's all of a sudden pretty good on. And Checkmate should be a good addition in order to fill up any holes between them. He didn't get much playtime last year after he got traded off Vancouver, but I really rate Slime's Lucio play. And that's like the teetering point that is getting me a bit more confident. Last year, they did well with Chris, okay? I was not a fan of Chris's main support gameplay. Slime, however, was the maniac from the Vancouver Titans season two GOATS prominence. Remember when Bumper was feeding all year? Slime is one of the reasons he could play that aggressive. I thought this guy was ridiculous. And now that he's guaranteed 100% playtime, it's adding confidence to me that OG will be comfortable on this team. Though, maybe at some point, I just have to give up and admit that he's just a moderate tier main tank on the league when in previous years I thought he could be more than that but <laughs> apparently it was still enough for me to still think this team is highly rated at eight next up at seven is Dallas and I really like when these videos seem to set up these really good comparisons because this roster just feels like a straight upgrade to me from Florida like very similar teams operate in a very similar way strong and similar positions but the tank line of Fearless and Hanbin is a straight upgrade. I mean, this might be one of the top three tank lines in the league. Outrageously good to me. And unlike some tanks that I can name in the league, I do not attribute Fearless's success with just his supports. I don't think everyone else was setting Fearless up for success. I think you can make an argument that last year he came in and defined how the Dragons played. And with his pristine gameplay, the rest of everything worked. Now, my question for the Dallas staff is, can you even handle Handle this level of talent? Do you know how to coach this talent? Which sounds like a silly question to ask, but they've had pretty talented players before and squandered it. So despite them just whipping out the checkbook and saying, let's just snag all the best free agents and players we can steal from other organizations, 
picking up some of the best players from Paris, stealing Fearless from the other region. Don't mess this up, Dallas. Other small red flags for you. I'm not so sold on Jexay's depth as a player. I think Lucio and Mercy he can do, but thankfully to cover that, if they need to play double flex support, Rappel can come in and they only have two DPS, Sparkle and Doha, which means to me, this is like the epitome of the type of roster that needs the right patch. Because if those players don't have their best DPS, Sparkle's Doomfist or Genji, and I don't think Doha is the guy they need him to be to sort of complement Sparkle, I kind of have questions there. But my assumptions are the rest of the team might still be able to just play the fundamentals so well, they might be able to replicate some of that clean gameplay that Fearless is used to on Shanghai, at least on some comps, right? If the right meta lands, think they can win a tournament. Next up at number six is the epitome of B tier. The Soul Dynasty seemed to sleep through half the season. Wake me up when the tournament starts. Could they win a tournament? Well, of course. They had a negative win rate last year and got second in a couple tournaments. You know what to expect from this roster. Jester and Profit love the tournament format and when their back's against the wall and they can play intuitively, they're gonna outskill a lot of teams in the league. Remembering, of course, in the grand finals run, Fitz, I'd have to double check this, but I think was the best Widowmaker. Just insane flanks, putting up huge numbers. This is a team that half of them play aggressively enough to make the play, which by the way, I think fits into how Overwatch is being balanced. Enough of this like carefully managing resources forever. I think Overwatch is gonna be a game where aggression gets rewarded and those chaotic trades and getting into clutch 3v3s is the norm. I think we're moving away from those really clean structured team fights, which, you know, like GOATS era, right? Order of operations, do you have the right ult? No, try to build it. That's the only way you're gonna win the fight. I don't think that's what we can expect Overwatch to be. And because of that, I think you can, reliably say half of this roster has the potential to do some damage in tournaments. And on top of that, now that they have an off tank in 2U, there's a chance they put Marvel in a bit more on main tank. Marvel's one of those players that is just dramatically underrated. The man is nuts on everything he's played on. And in fact, I like him on main tank. It's just gesture is a nut. If, and if you want to play to swing for the fences, so to speak, you might as well take the gamble on gesture to see what he can do. Whereas I think Marvel's more reliable, but also can play like Sig really well. He's just really talented. So too much talent on this roster to put them any lower, though I will say Animo on main support is a little boring of a pickup. Like, imagine if this team got slime. Like, then I'd be super excited and might even put them higher. Animo on the NYXL was one of those players that I sort of blame for their passive playstyle that always would struggle against top tier teams, but perhaps I'm wrong in that assumption and it was just the system that team wanted to play. So if we can see some more aggression out of Animo, especially, I mean, I think the broadcast at some point brought up he has like the most healing as Lucio which is just bad right it's just not it's just not a good way to play the character so not when you're going up against the FD gods and funny Astros you know the top tier aggressive Lucios that you will go up against in order to go all the way but they made it work with creative last year and stole the starting position from Bedosian, having a really powerful and intuitive playstyle with gesture on the hog meta that was like at least half of their success, I'd say, due to that, just clutching it out with Ana and Roadhog abilities. Uh, the other half fits sniping people. So I will say, I don't think this roster upgraded massively from last year. In fact, if they put the fan favorite player SBB in, if they put him in at all, I think you're gonna struggle. Like there's no pick. I think he can play better than Fitz and Profit. Maybe Reaper at this point, there's more of a shot calling role. I could see him playing that. Maybe he does a few niche strats for them. I hope he just, they just don't overuse him is what I'm saying because I think it'll come back to bite them I'd rather them invest in their star DPS who are there for the long term I think but that's no offense to SBB legend in the game I'm just worried because soul has made awkward substitutions in the past and I just looks like a trap seeing it on the uh, roster list. Coming at the number five spot, rounding out the B tier is the Washington Justice, a team where I had to go back and edit this ranking because I had them higher, but kicking myself, I just can't help but suspect that the style of roster they're going for isn't going to see the, the type of success that the teams I have above them will. So the recording's gonna be a little messed up when I say the number ranking after this point. But the reason why so many are so high on the Washington Justice is that we know Decay is outrageous. He played on Dallas, 
who's getting destroyed, looked insane there. Went on to Washington last year, where he nearly just dragged the Washington justice, kicking and screaming into the playoffs, seemingly single-handedly, okay? So you take that and you add in the most sought after main tank from tier two, Mag. You pick up Fury, stealing him away from Philadelphia Fusion, Rhea from the Eastern region, Assassin, a bomb rookie DPS, Jerry, flashes of success on hitscan from Boston, and Tuba, solid flex DPS. And then on the bottom, you have Bebe and Closer. Uh, early scrims are saying this is a team that pounds raw skill run you over gg go next so i kind of bought into the hype a bit originally like i was gonna put him at a higher tier but then i'm like i think this team is gonna look closer to soul so i dropped them down as the last team that i think could win a tournament in the right circumstances it's gonna depend the style of the meta i think the more split and fraggy it is the more these individuals will shine and they're more stacked than soul less accomplished but on paper these guys are cracked I, but i think if they start to get to the type of meta where the experience and teamwork and precision of your execution matter then having closer and bebe who are just average owl level players for me if not worse from their experience in the league backing up a strong tank line i just think a couple things like Fury gets a lot of credit for his insane results early in Overwatch League, but I think the standard of off tank has risen. There's many more players that are similar in skill level to Fury now than when he impressed us with insane diva play in season one. He's not a weakness by any regard, but I just think that the standard for tank lines is higher now overall. So to gap the enemy from that position is not as easy. In fact, I think you need a back line to do so. And if you don't have that, I think more often than not, your tanks might feel a little high and dry with the plays needing to set them up or be the difference maker to for them to gap the enemy's front line being from your back line. And if I'm questioning Washington's ability to do that, I think there's metas they're consistently weak at. Although there are some metas you can imagine that they'd be outrageous in. So the more they can put the ball in Decay's hand, for example, the more of a shot you have. But the less that's the case, I think you could drop this team considerably. Maybe even as low as one full tier, which makes no sense on paper, but might be the effect that you get. Like I'm getting hints of last year's Atlanta team, where we looked at the team on paper, and then in practice, they were just a gatekeeper team all year. Our expectations of this roster may turn into that, despite some absolute studs on this team. Okay, moving up, getting to the end now, this is the top tier, A tier of the league. I'm gonna put Fusion at number five, which is scary because the reports are that they're struggling to get visas for their players. Remembering that they switched over to the Eastern region, not in NA anymore. So there's a chance a significant number of their players and key ones at that won't be able to play for the foreseeable future. So it depends how long that's a problem. If Funny Astro doesn't play the whole year, my opinion changes completely because I think Funny Astro is the number one reason for me they were able to play that rush style so proficiently. This might come up in guides at some point. I was have been researching this for a long time, but there were matches in the league last year where they tried to run a different strat in a series. It was failing. Then they switched over to rush, swapping Funny Astro back to Lucio and not even having practiced it for that week. They did a reverse sweep on the Gladiators. Their peak power of that comp and that style, which I think is like core to Overwatch now, a lot of it rests on him to be honestly built diff than almost all the other Lucios in the league. There's like three-ish that I put close to him. But between that, Alarm, S-tier flex support, if those guys get to play, just them two, you can take a mix of anybody else. I cannot see them falling any lower than B-tier because any other mix of these players that they have on the roster, even if a few of them are out, unless they have to pick up a significant number of new players to slot in, I at worst would put them at B tier, could win a tournament. Because let's look at the rest of what they have here. There's been a lot of talk of DPS of DPS pickups across the league. Most of them are rookies. The Fusion went after surefire bets, in my opinion, with Shockwave and Rascal. Shockwave was a player who made massive plays on a team that was terrible. He was still fragging on Vancouver, despite them losing like every game. Rascal is a player whose ceiling on 
some flex DPS is literally number one. I thought his echo was second to none in that meta. Now, like Fleda got MVP and got the echo skin and everything. And the shock maybe didn't play echo as long. And so the history of this is kind of skewed, but I think Rascal's echo was game changing. And then he's also got the main, he's got other picks. Okay, so this DPS core is great. The only question mark is how much gas in the tank does Carpe have? Because what's the reason for Hisu subbing in for him last year? Is that a coach that now is gone? <laughs> but even that, if I recall correctly, Shockwave played some hit scan. So even if they want to sub out Carpe, I just don't see how you're going to struggle at the DPS position with any of these players. Okay, now move on to the rest. Toby's picked up as a sub for Funny Astro. Going to be a severe downgrade if they have to play with him for the whole year. But even at worst, I think they would fall to mid table. On the tank position, there's question marks on Mano because just like Animo that I mentioned earlier, is Mano to blame? for some of the dysfunction and inability to kind of break that glass ceiling and and win the league. At periods, the NYXL were dominant, but they never really got their moment to say they were the best, at least in like the playoffs or grand finals. Meta changes are the norm in Overwatch now, so it's possible that that one magical meta playing defensive around a Zenyatta was the one that those NYXL players were elite at. Is Mono going to be capable of doing what a main tank needs to do? My assumption is definitely yes. If you remember back to all my like backhanded compliments of Sato, where he cleaned up fights that his team had already won for him. I think if you put Mano on the fusion last year, they only do better. That's it. It's just a straight upgrade because I think the position of main tank has changed so that it's not as flexible and it's not as flexible as it once was. In the 2-2-2 format after GOATS, the positions you're allowed to play are almost rote. And anytime Sato tried to venture away or play kind of loosey-goosey on Winston, the enemy team just sort of laughed and ate up free team fight wins. I don't think Mano is going to do that. And in fact, I think the Fusion have finally come to the conclusion that I've been saying about Saddle for all this time, that he is not the guy that is going to do well against top tier competition, which I think was a major contributing factor to them struggling in some of the tournaments last year, as well as the grand final tournament. Mano, on the other hand, I think will get you the results you're looking for, even if it's being widely reported that they are getting wrecked in scrims which might be because they're on advanced ping due to where they're playing in from, can't get visas, might not have all their players. Okay, fine. I've equivocated as much as I'm willing to. Uh, unfortunately, Poco seems to be another player that might not be making the cut. Instead, they have Hotba, who is a bit of a downgrade, I would say. But similar to Mano, I wonder if these tanks look entirely different as soon as Funny Astro gets to play, right? Like, I think it hinges on that so much. And we may even see a night and day difference between when Toby's filling in to when they get to bring Astro back. The space that you create for your tanks to play in as a Lucio is outrageous in terms of the ceiling it has and Funny Astro reaches it, in my opinion. Moving on to the number four position, I'm putting the LA Gladiators. They have made significant upgrades this year. I felt the past couple years, I was just not so happy with their backline power, especially with how required it is to really reach the top level. And I think one of the fastest routes to guarantee you do that is with support power because the position does so much for the team. Like it's gonna modify how strong your tank line is. And once they're strong, you put yourself in a position where just matching up face to face with a lot of teams in the league, it's gonna feel like a struggle to lose just from how much pressure the core of your team puts out. And that's what I see happening for the Gladiators, where, okay, they got Muse on main tank, rookie, strong performer and contenders, but that's like the biggest worry for me. You're putting a lot of faith in a very important position as a rookie, but he's about as comfortable as any rookie tank could be. With veteran and two-time league winner, Moth, leaving the San Francisco Shock to come play on the Gladiators. On flex support, they have Shu, who is a player that looked pretty cracked on Guangzhou, but the management of that team just never really actualized the potential of their players, in my opinion. So the question mark is, does he look even more insane on a team who's competing at a higher level? I think there's a good chance. And at the end of the year, we might be saying this is the best backline in the league. I think last year, the style that Coach Dipe was imposing wasn't as effective with the players he had. This was said on broadcast, I think, at some point where the analyst explained that 
Dipe tries to empower his players by giving them a lot of decision making to sort of make intuitive win conditions rather than executing pristine strats. And as I said earlier in the video, I think that's like where Overwatch is going, functionally speaking. I think he finally has the skill level of players that can pull that off on top of just being good at the game normally. Like, it's not like that's all they do. This is also the team who has brought the most successful set plays into the playoffs. They are famous for the Great Bamboozle, which you can check out a breakdown on the channel for. But the DPS, I would say I wouldn't describe as cracked as other DPS cores, but I don't think they'll ever let you down. Like, you watch Bird Ring season last year, and he may have been one of the most consistent hit scans in the league. The team was kind of up and down, but Bird Ring always did his job. I think Kevster has that sort of S factor that'll maybe be the extreme playmaker that they need to clutch fights and mirror was so good that he was filling in on support i don't think he's going to need to do that this year with the talent they have but mirror is pretty cracked on some of the flex dps but i think flex dps is just a more stacked role in the league so overall i think if their dps have good years they could go even higher than four and the way overwatch works frankly it's kind of a compounding effect like, it's hard to know if sections of the team are struggling, what another section of the team might accomplish if they had better teammates, right? Like, Overwatch fights typically kind of snowball in that way, where you start winning thanks to a teammate, then you win harder and it gets easier. And, well, I think the Gladiators have an opportunity to go really far this year. And I, I would describe them as a very well-designed team. Like, I can see how these pieces fit together. There's a good mix of supporting style teammates and aggressive teammates in a palpable mixture for me. Now, next up, number two, Shanghai Dragons. I almost put this team lower, but they have Coach Moon and had a dominant season last year with a lot of these same players, frankly. The league MVP on their team and sort of set the template for that clean, organized Overwatch where Lee J. Gong plays aggressively to find the opening as main support. Void pretty much makes no mistakes, plays off tank to perfection. Izaki Loki is like really talented, has been his whole career, always puts up huge stats and a lot of depth at the DPS position they added more to it with Erster getting finally picked up to hopefully see some play time. When we saw him get to play in the league in season two, he was outrageous, but then never really saw daylight again. So on an Eastern team, maybe he's more comfortable culturally and whatever was the reason he wasn't getting play time now is gone. A lot of the same reasons they were dominant last year look to shape up this year. A big change though is losing Fearless for Fate, which is... An interesting change for this team because Fearless, I thought was the like identity of the Dragons last year, but did share some time with Stand 1. It always looked like a mistake to me, but he did share some time. Fate is a guy who plays all the main tanks, but perhaps isn't as high on Winston as Fearless was. But that might let the Shanghai Dragons be stronger on comps that aren't dive. And while maybe losing a little bit from the Winston position, it's pretty well known that Fate is a vocal shot caller in the teams he plays on now on an Eastern team. Maybe he's even more comfortable. I assume speaking in his native tongue. Remember, Fate was one of the best main tanks in season one of Overwatch League, had a weak GOATS era. Last year, really strong on the Mayhem, actually. Like, one of the best parts. And I think a contributing factor to them playing the game really cleanly. So I anticipate Fate to fit into the Dragons really well and then them to more or less pick up where they left off. Now, the only reason I hesitate keeping them at two is because I don't know if I really feel you can earn the two spot in the overall league, even if you dominate the East. I think they're set up to do that again, but I just don't really rate the East. And I think what we may find is that the Dragons might lose in the final four a bit more than we like in order to confidently keep them as number two. We'll know by the end of the year, but I think there's a chance that even just based on the lack of experience playing against the Western teams, they may be at a bit of a disadvantage, spending too much time on what I think is weaker opposition in the East. There's more top teams in the West, in my opinion, and, you know, by my rankings, especially if Philly literally isn't there, right? 
Like if Philly is there at full force, then Shanghai have something to race against. But when your next best teams are like Guangzhou kind of, or Seoul, if they show up, like the East is just kind of all over the place. The fact that analysts can legitimately claim that the Hunters might be a top three team in the East, I think tells you all you need to know. Their style of Overwatch is simply different. And when it comes into clash with the West more often, who, I mean, you know, we say the West, but really we mean mixed teams filled with Koreans, teams that spend a lot more money, it feels like sometimes, I think then you're going to start to notice the actual gap between the regions. But I say all that and still kept them number two. I, I think they can punch up to that level, but I also could see some reasons why they wouldn't. And surprise, surprise, number one position, we're going to remain the San Francisco Shock. We're calling this the S tier for Shock, but also for Krusty, who has proven time and time again to be the difference maker that keeps franchises on point. This is the man who transformed the Boston Uprising into one of the worst teams into a flawless stage in season one, then has proven to be able to refine Overwatch metas unlike any other coach. They copy his homework. And some years I try to pick holes at the roster to say they have gaps here or have gaps there. An example, last year, I try to point out not too confident in their DPS, actually. I think they're weak at ranged hit scan. Everyone hypes up Striker and how good he is. I think he's elite on Tracer, normal on range DPS. Well, what do they do? They go pick up some rookie all-star Ons who has like the most dominant widow year of any player ever. Wins a grand final and retires. Now what do they do? Okay, still have that gap in my opinion. They fill it with Glister, who is the most talented player on that London roster from a bit back, played with Benar and them. Glister was the other player that was consistently making plays there. Is he going to be as good as Anz? I think that's difficult, but he might not need to be if the balance of the game is kind of trying to take some power out of that range DPS carry potential. Anyway, we didn't really see Tayo, so I don't know what to think of him. Still on the bench, still on the roster, but Nero was a shining flex DPS playmaker when he spent some time languishing in the East. I look forward to his potential this year, but I don't think he's going to live up to Rascal because how can you? I will say he's better on some picks than Rascal is, particularly like Doomfist, I think. But either way, kind of doesn't matter because we know this isn't why the Shock win the league. The DPS usually are like along for the ride half the time. It is the rest of this roster with Super and Smurf holding down all the main tanks. Choyobin, who is like a flawless off tank. Violet, who is the most cracked Zenyatta in the league. And in case they need double flex support, they have Twilight to complement that, which just feels unfair. He was the star flex on the Vancouver Titans in the GOATS era, who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shock, causing them enough head headaches for Krusty to just pick up that player. And then on top of that, although they lost Moth, went over to the Gladiators, they pick up FD God, who is the only guy who I look at and say he's close to as good as Funny Astro. Maybe even a little bit mechanically better, but I think he exchanges that for maybe a little bit over aggression at times. I think this is going to kind of be the good benchmark for us to look at for how important I'm rating supports to be for this year, because perhaps it's the case that Moth's shot calling was a vital component to the shot's success. I don't think that's the case. I'm going to bet that it's more so Krusty's coaching that improves them over time in a meta, but we shall see. Perhaps FD God doesn't pick it up in that capacity, but I think what he will do is add a small upgrade in the aggressive playmaking department that Moth was good at, but maybe not elite at. So at some point, we might look at this roster and try our best to poke holes at why they won't win a third time, but the only thing that I can point to is that they've lost coaches. <laughs> That's the most important thing to me and going to be the first question I ask if they struggle in the first tournament. The way the Shock have won for the past couple years is that even when meta changes come in, although they might be a little slow to start, they refine what the plays in teamwork and positioning and rotations are to such 
an immaculate degree that by the time you reach the time period of it being like end game of the meta where you've had the meta state for a few weeks and now it's time to get into the later stages of the tournament the shocker just playing cleaner than anybody when everyone else has had the opportunity to improve at the same rate right like they have this extra fifth gear they go into where they just play overwatch better than everyone else it's unfair okay like the thing is i just feel the coaching staff of the shock can take any top tier player put them onto this team and they're going to have an all-star performance eventually late into those meta cycles just because of their ability to improve their players over time any weakness you might think fd god has i'm willing to bet it's just going to look better this season i don't think anybody comes to this team looking to force their style onto the shock. No, I think instead, Krusty is going to use a aggressive player like FD God and put them strategically into the system. My example for this is I watched Super play in NA for years. The most defining thing about Super was his aggression. Young kid comes in the league, finally gets to play in season one, doesn't look great. Krusty comes in and the Krusty effect completes the full arc. Put, put your training montages or whatever you want to put in order to make the analogy to land this. But Super went from a aggressive playmaking player to a very conservative Goats Reinhardt. Bumper is out there feeding. Super is holding the line, never stepping out of position ever. Smurf is a tank that did anybody think was going to be a top tank in the league when he was coming in originally? I think he got picked up by Houston and then got traded to the Shock. And then all of a sudden, he's the best Winston in the league. What? How did that happen? Right? We just sort of like take it for granted that the Shock have the best players. And I just don't think that's the case. I think if you take any top tier player and put them onto the Shock, they become the best in their role. Okay, it's not like the, the players are inherently that good. That's not how it works. Because if that was the case, they would look better in intuitive metas, in a style that the Soul Dynasty is good at, where the meta rule set are simplified because they're not figured out yet, and it's more about the players making clutch plays. That's what Soul was good at last year. That's what got them to the Grand Finals. But what makes the Shock win the Grand Final is that all the playmaking magic in the world can get figured out once you have your execution to an elite degree. So S tier goes to the shock, one team above the rest because the management staff and training and whatever they do, I don't know if they got these guys on the keto diet or whatever, <laughs> like the, their performances are just, they time and time again, late into tournaments, turn things around. Remember, this is a team who has lost early and come back. In season two, they lost to the Atlanta Reign in the double elimination tournament. If it wasn't double elim, they straight up would have lost the league, right? They were one game away, backs against the wall. And the reason was, is because there was a meta swap after they were going on a, a full map win streak, right? They had perfected GOATs. The meta swapped, they struggled early, got knocked down. Luckily it was double elim because they clawed all the way back and won the grand final easily in the same meta, same patch right? They lose to the rain, then dominate the Vancouver Titans in the final. Okay, same thing. Last year's grand final tournament, all of a sudden, hog meta. Didn't play it the entire year. They struggled to find what they want to do with it, seemed a little resistant to some of the meta forces, looked a little uncomfortable at start, but by the end, were so incredibly precise against Prophet and Gesture, who just looked like in their element. Against everybody else, Prophet and Gesture were just clowning. But once they figured out how to set up Violet Zenyatta on the ranged angles and never be out of position, it really wasn't close, right? How many times is the Shock gonna improve at a meta and make it not close against the next best teams in the league and win? Are we not just gonna say they have the best route to success in Overwatch? How dare any of you challenge this team? At this point, I don't think it's impressive if they get a three-peat. In fact, I'm the other way. I would be impressed if they didn't get a three-peat. I think their ability to improve at Overwatch, which is required with the way the metas change, is just simply better than everyone else. No one else knows how to do it like the Shock. So maybe they don't win it all this year, but at worst, I see them dropping one tier and then maybe being right back on it next year. Their system is too good. They're too far ahead of everyone else in this specific capacity for me to even entertain that they shouldn't be number one. It doesn't matter, right? They could pick up at random players from the other top teams near them and still win. That's how confident I am in their system. So that's everything we've done the entire tier list. I hope you guys did enjoy the video. If you 
did, please be sure to leave it a like. It really helps us out and lets us know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, click subscribe and be sure to hit the bell icon to actually get notified when our next videos come out. Been hyped getting in the momentum of making more videos again. I'm gonna try to make as many as I can. Overwatch League is back, baby, and it's got a good format this year. If you're hyped for it, let me know in the comment section down below. But other than that, that's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.